Our speaker today is Vinton Cerf, who is Vice President of Google and their Chief Internet Evangelist. He is also a visiting scientist at uh, JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He is co-designer of the TCP IP protocols and the architecture of the Internet, which qualifies him as one of the fathers of the Internet. He has served on so many positions in so many institutions that we really don't have time to list them all if we expect to listen to him today. But they include Stanford University, uh, DARPA, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers Icon, Stop Badware, and that's a, an institution I wish uh, certainly all success to, and the Visiting Committee on Advanced Technology for NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, he was chair of that committee. President Obama appointed him to the National Science Board in 2012. His honors would likewise take entirely too long to try to list all of them. They include the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom, the U.S. National Medal of Technology, the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, the ACM Turing Award, Officer of the Legion d'Honneur, that means Legion of Honor in English, and 21 honorary degrees. He is a fellow of the IEEE, the ACM, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Computer History Museum, and he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, with all that behind him, it's not surprising that in December 1994, People Magazine identified Surf as one of that year's 25 most intriguing people. His personal interests include fine wine, gourmet cooking, and science fiction. I can personally vouch for that last because when he was a speaker at Balticon, the Baltimore Science Fiction Convention, that my colleague Karen North spotted him and invited him to come speak here today, which uh, let's get on to that with no further ado. Will you join me, please, in welcoming Vinton Cerf? Thank you. I always get nervous when people clap before you've said anything. It feels like I should just sit down because it won't get any better than that. Uh, let me just verify by stepping away from this microphone that the lavalier mic is still working. You can hear me okay. The usual question is, can you hear me back there in the rear? And no, no, the answer is we're not built that way, but it's okay. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to, uh, to talk to you about a problem which has been disturbing me for quite some time and some other people for even longer than that, some of whom are here in this uh, auditorium. And it has to do with the preservation of digital information over long periods of time. Uh, I don't pretend to be expert at this, so why am I up here lecturing? It's mostly just to raise the level of uh, awareness and sensitivity not only uh, for our own personal interests, like you know, our photographs and uh, important correspondence and the like, but also for what we do here at, uh, at Goddard, and that is uh, collect very valuable, very expensive, uh, and hard to get scientific information, which we want to preserve over long periods of time, because the value may in fact increase as opposed to decrease over time, and yet there are many, many challenges uh, in, in front of us. So I'm going to try to touch on both the uh, institutional challenge of uh, archiving significant uh, quantities of technical data accumulated from our exploratory experiments, but also uh, information that you and I might uh, hope is preserved for uh, our uh, descendants over time. So let me just start by observing that uh, static content has been archived in a variety of ways, some of them uh, quite uh, robust over periods of time, like the uh, cuneiform tablets, which uh, were not originally designed to be long-lasting. Many of them were, were just transactional information about uh, trade, for example. But uh, they acquired their longevity because fires sometimes burned down the buildings and baked the clay tablets into very hard, very long-lasting material. Um, papyrus, on the other hand, was not designed to be a long-lasting material, but it ended up in places that allowed it to last for a long time, like the caves uh, in uh, Qumran, for instance, where uh, things were very, very dry and, uh, and the uh, papyrus did not uh, disintegrate, although it did dry out. Uh, but there is uh, also you know, high quality rag content, books that were published before 1800 often still look pretty good today because there was a high amount of cotton in the, in the uh, paper. Uh, 
as opposed to after the 1800s when people figured out how to make really cheap paper using a sulfur process, which eventually caused the paper to pick up uh, you know, moisture from the atmosphere and turn it into sulfur sulfuric acid, which is why newspapers turn yellow. Uh, over a rather short period of time. And then there's vellum, which is basically sheepskin or goatskin or some other animal skin, which is a highly uh, resilient material. There are vellum manuscripts which are well uh, beyond a excuse me, a thousand years old. Uh, I, you know, I've held some of them in my hands, and if you can still read you know, ancient uh, Greek or Latin or something, there, and some of them are beautifully illustrated. Uh, of course, uh, I don't come to you suggesting that we should use vellum as uh, the storage medium for our data because a lot of dead sheep would be required for that. Uh, you know, you can imagine handing somebody a manuscript saying many sheep died to preserve this information. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a lesson that uh, is important to know that these older media for this kind of material, uh, some of which have, have lasted for quite a long time. Uh, now let's look at our digital media, and you'll recognize many of these things, and you'll probably also recognize that we don't exactly have a lot of reading equipment left to read eight inch long disk drives, or five and a quarter inch floppies, or three and a half inch floppies, or VHS. I keep a one VHS um, you know, uh, recorder or uh, player in the house so that I can still watch old VHS tapes or convert them from uh, VHS to DVD. You're not supposed to be able to do that, but you know, there are ways of achieving this. Unfortunately, even DVDs are becoming less available. Those of you who have Macintosh equipment will have noticed that the CD-ROM reader has disappeared from uh, the current brand of uh, MacBook. Uh, so, uh, and there are external hard drives and things like that, but the connectors turn out to be a problem. So we have the possibility of storing digital information in media that no longer can be read, even if the bits are still there. And this leaves out, of course, the other problem, which is even if we pull the bits off of these media, do we know what the bits mean? And this poses yet another major problem uh, for uh, digital um, uh, preservation. So uh, one thing I wanted to uh, emphasize, it, oh, I see what's happened. I've been flipping the charts, and you haven't seen them because I'm doing it on my laptop and not over here. So those are the things I was just talking about. Those are the things that I was just talking about. Now, we, I apologize for that. Normally, my laptop is connected to the projector, and it's not. So I have to be uh, ambidextrous for today. So I wanted to emphasize that this problem is known by many people. I'm not the only person to have noticed that we have a problem. Uh, and I want to draw attention to a book which I was uh, given, actually, about two weeks ago called Advanced Digital Preservation uh, by uh, David Gioretta. Uh, this is actually a very hefty 500-page tome. And it goes into great detail about the open archival information system architecture. Uh, it digs very deep into uh, concepts that would allow you to build archives that have a reasonable hope of lasting for long periods of time or adapting uh, over long periods of time to new architectures, uh, new digital media, uh, new kinds of uh, instruments, uh, and new programming languages and the like. One nice thing to know is that the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems uh, has a uh, representation here at, uh, at Goddard in the form of the uh, Digital Archive Ingestion Group, uh, some of whom I met uh, just prior to, uh, to coming to the auditorium. Uh, the attention that's being paid there, I think, is very important because there is a great deal of value in the scientific data collected by robotic and manned space exploration, and it's almost without doubt that that data will be useful 10 years, 20 years, 100 years from now possibly confirming new theories, or possibly being reanalyzed to discover things that we didn't know we should be looking for in that data in the past. The National Science Foundation has also recognized the importance of preservation of digital information with a research data alliance effort, which is quite distributed. Uh, it's led by Fran Berman and John Wood, who co-chair the committee, and they, uh, they are responsible for allocating resources to support uh, a wide range of efforts to uh, preserve digital information. Uh, I'm going to be in Iceland uh, in the next week um, to meet with the International Internet Preservation Consortium. It's about 
well, there were, there were about 400 people in the room the last time I met with them, which made me feel better that there were hundreds of people who actually cared about this stuff. Um, and I invited uh, Mike Kearney, who was part of the, was anyway, part of the CCSDS activity. He retired officially and is now back uh, in the fray uh, with a contractor hat on. Um, but Mike has been very vocal uh, about the importance of this kind of uh, preservation. And I don't mean to go through every single one of these, but I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that this is not a, an effort which has gone uh, unaddressed. It's just that we still have a great deal of work to do uh, to achieve some kind of long-term uh, success. I would wa do want to draw attention to Brewster Kale. Uh, for those of you who track these sorts of things, Brewster is sort of an uber geek. Uh, he's the guy that wired the first connection machine that Danny Hillis designed at MIT some years ago. But he recognized this problem of archiving the World Wide Web, and so now he has crawlers that run around uh, essentially ingesting web pages the same way we do at Google, although our purpose is to index. His purpose is to actually capture the web pages and store them away. Uh, and so he's been doing that for um, about 15, maybe more years uh, in a facility in San Francisco. Uh, he has a backup facility at the Library of Alexandria in Egypt, not Virginia. Uh, and another one, I think, in Asia, but I don't forget where. It may have been Keio University, but I'm not certain of that. So he's been trying to somehow absorb the World Wide Web, which, of course, is a, an impossible task considering its scale. But he has a lot of it, and he has this Wayback Machine, so you can actually go and look at web pages at, at a particular uh, domain name as they looked 10 years ago or 15 or 20 years ago. So it's actually quite helpful when people have disputes over what happened when or what, was, what were people capable of doing, he's capable of taking you back in time to see what, what the content of the web pages were. Uh, so, uh, and uh, oh, there's one other here at the bottom. NEON is the uh, National Ecological Observation Network is a major effort at uh, NSF to build uh, observ observation stations, towers all the way across the country for both water and atmospheric sensing and to gather all of that data concurrently and then to try to make a model out of what it's telling us about the ecological conditions in the U.S. and ultimately they hope elsewhere. So this is not just about preserving things by moving bits from one medium to another, although that too will be required over time just as we all don't know that we have problems. There we go again, I forget to do this. You could just holler at me if I appear to be speaking to a slide that isn't up there and it will help my memory. So we have to worry about, you know, what, what is the shape of a, of a digital object? You know, how is it structured? How is it represented? What vocabulary and standard terminology should we use to describe this stuff in a way that other people will understand it or that a program could understand it, which is sometimes harder than getting people to understand things. Uh, we need to have common identifier spaces so we can make reference to digital objects and digital content. Uh, we have to be able to refer to the registries where they are or the repositories where they are. We have to be able to resolve references to them. So let me give you an example. Everybody uses the World Wide Web. When you type a URL in, uh, something happens called a domain name lookup that translates into an IP address and that takes you to a website typically and then you download whatever that web page is. There's an interesting, sad irony about the World Wide Web. Uh, it was developed originally by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN in order to help his physis physicist friends get access to each other's information. Primarily, I think, um, papers, renderable materials uh, that uh, were hard to come by. He wanted to make it as easy as clicking on a hyperlink in order to pull up uh, this documentation. But uh, every one of you, I'm sure, has experienced the click on a link and getting back 404, you know, site not found or unresolved uh, domain name. Uh, what happened, and this, this is a, a real lesson, I think, for those of us who believe that uh, commercialization is sometimes helpful because it creates a, an economic engine to support the process. Domain names used to be free of charge, run by uh, a volunteer named John Postel at USC Information Sciences Institute who maintained a notebook of assigned uh, top-level domain names. Um, what happened is that uh, somebody decided spending research money from NSF uh, 
to maintain the domain name system seemed silly because it was mostly now being used around 1992 uh, in uh, the booming, uh, you know, dot com, uh, dot, dot boom period. And so they said, uh, why don't you just charge for this uh, and pay, let it pay for itself? Uh, well, in fact, that's exactly what happened. The trouble is that if somebody fails to pay their monthly or, or yearly registration for a domain name, it may no longer resolve, in which case all the things that it pointed to may disappear. Even if they're still physically on the net, you can't find them because the reference no longer resolves. And so uh, this really elegant design has led us, uh, the commercialization of it has led us to this fragility which we need to overcome. Uh, it's pretty clear reading this book and meeting with the, uh, uh, the DAI group uh, earlier today that uh, ingestion of data needs to be really thoughtful and very rigorous. A lot of information, representation information and the like, all the metadata. Where did the data come from? How are the instruments calibrated? How do I tell that it's authentic data and so on? All has to be accounted for if we're going to have archives that are useful uh, either in the present and in the future. The other thing which uh, one of my colleagues uh, who gave me this book uh, is tackling is the legal framework in which this kind of preservation is supported. There's, are there issues associated with software, for example? Some people own the software and they don't want you to use it unless you pay them royalties for it or license fees. Uh, for some period of time. So it could be patent, which is 17 years, but those patents often get extended in various ways. Uh, or copyright, which is 70 years after the death of the author, which I think is excessive, but you know that's the way the intellectual property community has pushed copyright law over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, so the question is whether or not we can get special um, dispensation under the patent and copyright laws, for example, to run software on behalf of third parties or uh, get access to uh, information which would otherwise be protected for purposes of preservation. And so we don't have uh, too many carve-outs. Libraries are special in the copyright law, and so they have privileges which you know, we might not have as ordinary citizens or as, uh, as corporations. Uh, I think the same kind of thing may ne be needed, and my colleague uh, who is working in this space has been looking at a variety of areas where preservation should be given uh, authorities that we wouldn't normally get in the commercial sector. And then there's this question of who's going to pay for it all? And this is a non-trivial problem, especially if you're talking about 100 to 1,000 years or something. Uh, I have been just, uh, for the heck of it, looking at um, Corporations that have lasted for a long time, and a few come to mind. How about the Catholic Church? That's a couple thousand years. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that they should become the uh, digital archive of record, but the fact that they persisted over a couple of thousand years is pretty interesting. The only other really long-term uh, um, companies that I know about tend to be breweries, you know, that have been around for <laughs> five or six hundred years, and you know, maybe they have caves, you know, down in the, you know, brickwork and, and dug into the, like the wineries. Uh, so I don't know whether that's indicative of the kind of organization that we might have to turn to for longevity, but it is kind of an interesting observation. Uh, and in the worst case, we can always just drink the beer and forget about the fact that we haven't succeeded in storing anything for long periods of time. But th these are, are just snapshot examples of the kinds of problems that are not necessarily technical but they have to be solved if we really are serious about preserving digital information or any kind of information for long periods of time. And now I have to remember to go there. Okay, so uh, here's a couple of problems. One of them is just scaling up, storing huge amounts of information that a lot of our instruments are producing, whether it's ground observatories or orbiting telescopes or robotic space probes or the Large Hadron Collider or the South Polar uh, Ice Cube. Uh, by the way, if you haven't read about this, it's absolutely amazing. And your TDRS system, by the way, is helping us pull data from the ice cube at the South Pole back to places where it's useful. Uh, this thing is literally at the South Pole. They drilled, I don't know, 5,000 holes in the ice, go down about a mile and a half, and they put detectors in the holes to sense the light that's generated by a high-power neutrino that interacts 
with you know, um, you know, ice and with water. Uh, it, as you all know, neutrinos don't interact with much of anything, and so when they do, you know, it's hard to detect. And these things are very, very powerful, uh, possibly coming from outside the galaxy. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I have the exact uh, metrics right, but there were three uh, incidents that were detected in the last year or so. Uh, one of them, I think, I, I think it's giga electron volts, but somebody here might tell me I'm wrong. There were two incidents that were 12 or 13 giga electron volts, and, one, and they called that big, they called that Bert and Ernie were uh, those two incidents. And then there was another detection later, it was like 28 giga electron volts, and that was Big Bird. So I don't know what's going to happen when they run out of Muppet names in order to <laughs> reference these things. Uh, but the point I want to make is that the data accumulating is significant in scale. And it's also fairly complex in structure. If you think about all of the information that's needed in order to make sense of the numbers that those data represent. I was told that, uh, that the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment packages, the ALSEP packages, uh, lost uh, a lot of data, or the, the uh, parties responsible for archiving the data lost some of it because they just repurposed the tapes that the data was written on. Uh, there's an, uh, an analog of this uh, in the vellum world, uh, in case you don't know. Uh, some people considered uh, vellum to be more valuable than that which was written on it. And so there have been attempts made to scrub the data from the vellum and to write on top of it. There's an example of this, it's called the Archimedes Palimpsest. If you have not read about it, I would recommend it. It's a fascinating story. The manuscript, sorry? We had a talk here around that. Yeah, that, yes. Uh, in fact, the Walters Library did, uh, did some beautiful uh, preservation work. The guy that owns it is in Fairfax County, it turns out. Uh, ha ha, he's in Virginia and not Maryland. You know. <laughs> I mean, you know. So I've lived in, Mar in, in Virginia for about 40 years, and I know there's this tension. Uh, anyway, what happened is this manuscript was, was copies of Archimedean works in Greek, and it was written around 1000 AD, kept in a monastery somewhere in the Middle East. It might have been Jerusalem, but I'm not certain of that. Um, and then around 1200 AD, the uh, abbot of the monastery decided that the vellum was more valuable than that which was written on it. So he had them scrub off as much as they could, rotate the vellum 90 degrees, cut it in half, and then uh, put a, um, a sort of a, an owner's manual, uh, the liturgy and other operating procedures for that monastery on this vellum thing. And that vellum stayed in the monastery for about 700 years until around 1900. Then it disappeared, and uh, nobody knew where it went until it reappeared in the attic of some Frenchman's house in 1998, where it was offered for auction. It was in terrible condition. It was, you know, all uh, sort of water dripped on it, and you know, mold, and it was all wrinkled and everything else. And so uh, my friend uh, took it to the Walters Library, um, spending about 1.6 million to acquire the uh, manuscript. And they have now uh, not only taken it apart because they had to literally they had to look in the binding in order to see the parts that used, had been written before it had been cut up. Uh, they discovered at least one uh, Archimedean writing that talked about um, what we would have called pre-calculus. Uh, he was Archimedes was apparently uh, familiar with the idea of infinitesimals and the notion of area under a curve. He never got quite as far as Isaac Newton and the others who uh, developed the calculus. But just think, in 300 BC, he was that far away from the calculus. So if that manuscript had been preserved and more widely available, you know, who knows what we might have accomplished. But the point I want to make is that uh, these things do disappear if we don't make a conscious effort uh, to preserve them. And so this particular situation with the tapes uh, is, uh, is not new. Uh, so the efforts here uh, the, to do a better job of instituting uh, preservation, I think, is very important. So from, uh, from uh, reading uh, David's book and the, the others who uh, helped author it, uh, I was attracted to this notion, since I'm a computer programmer by trade, uh, 
to the recursive element that was in here. You had to define representations of things and then the reference, the, the description of the representation might actually be recursive because it had to refer to something else. And eventually it's turtles all the way down. Uh, the question is how do you stop the recursion? And a very clever idea uh, was introduced and that is called the designated community. And what happens is that you do the representation and you represent the representation, you keep going, until you get to the point where there is a community that actually understands what the lowest level representation means and you don't have to go any further than that. Except for one problem, what happens if that designated community dies out and nobody remembers what that meant? So now we have this problem that uh, we have to be conscious of whether there is longevity in the designated community itself. And if there isn't for some reason, then the whole process of archiving has to take that into account and provide additional information so as to allow the data, which is represented in the, these complex ways, to be correctly interpreted by a less well-informed designated community. And when we're talking about hundreds of, of years or thousands of years, it's almost certain that the designated community um, will, available designated community will change with time and possibly uh, have less uh, knowledge than the one that triggered the original archiving process. It's also pretty clear <clears throat> that um, we have quite a wide variety of information and information structures that we may have to capture. And so these very complex kinds of objects that get generated in, in the course of measuring data have to be not only captured but described uh, in, with su sufficient precision that first we can unpack them, but second we can understand their semantics. And that too is a very major problem, figuring out what vocabulary to use to describe the semantics of a complex data object so that uh, software can be written to correctly interpret that is again uh, a fairly significant challenge. So one thing which is uh, certain to be important is that we have to be systematic about this. This cannot be an accidental thing. This cannot be a casual thing. Uh, and what NASA and others, especially those working on OAIS, have done is to describe uh, in this book and, uh, and elsewhere a very systematic approach to figuring out whether or not the archiving process is actually reliable or has taken into account that which would make it reliable. There are also uh, recognizable pressures coming from the federal government with regard to uh, government-supported research pressing the need for preservation of, uh, of the digital information that's generated. The President's Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology and the Office of Science and Technology Policy have mandated that all of the federal agencies, including NASA, uh, make certain that uh, when they uh, award contracts uh, outside or when they do work inside of NASA that there is attention paid to the capture uh, and preservation of digital content. And of course this question of affordability again raises its ugly head because uh, if we're talking about hundreds of thousands, a thousand years or something, the business model uh, that will retain that information and maintain its availability is uh, a challenge. Uh, I also think that it will be very important not to rely on some big central archive somewhere um, because again longevity is uh, in question and the distribution of the archive material might turn out to be important so if an archive fails you haven't lost everything. We learned that lesson at Google uh, very very clearly and early on when we started building multiple data centers we replicate data inside the data center so that if a portion of the data center fails, we haven't lost anything. And we replicate the data across data centers in case we've lost uh, a data center. And the same thing could be true for a serious effort at long-term archiving. One thing which um, I think is very important that in addition to having policies and practices, procedures uh, like this book outlines, that it's important that the implementations of these archives be interworkable. And the reason that that's important is that you don't want to wind up having to rely on a particular archive for a particular kind of data, only to have that archive disappear. And so having multiple archives that can handle the same kind of information uh, and, and can be used by the, arc, the, the parties relying on archive with equal facility is very important. So interworking uh, 
among the archives and the ability of a designated community member to get access to data from any of a number of archives is important. It's especially true for this concept of succession where if an archive is demonstrably going to go out of operation, if you know that ahead of time, you want to be able to migrate the information to other archives that are still equally accessible and useful to the designated community. And of course, whatever we do, uh, taking into account the example of PCAST and OSTP, we need policy frameworks that will create incentives for the building and uh, operating of these archives. So I want to switch gears a little bit to focus in on a particular problem. This is not so much the problem of the scaling uh, and the complex data objects that uh, NASA has to deal with, but it has a lot to do with um, digital information that you and I might care a lot about. For example, our family photographs or videos on YouTube, Flickr, and Picasa. Um, it turns out that there is a lot of software involved in rendering uh, this kind of digital material. And so I want to give you a concrete example of, of something I wonder about. Some of you will have read a book by Doris Kearns Goodwin called A Team of Rivals. It's about Lincoln's hiring of all of his rivals to become, uh, for the presidency to become uh, members of his cabinet, hence the term Team of Rivals. If you read the book, what you read is a substantial amount of dialogue in the book, which sounds quite credible. Uh, and it's kind of surprising that it sounds so credible. And I asked myself, how did she do that? Because she wasn't around in 1860 when all these events were taking place. At least I don't think so. And it turns out she went to, I don't know how many libraries. I, didn't, I made up the number 100. But she had to have gone to a lot of different libraries to get their correspondence to see what topics they were talking about and how they expressed their views. And then from this, she was able to reconstruct credible you know, conversations uh, among the various parties. So then I got to thinking, well, what if one of you is a 22nd century or you're one of your descendants is a 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodwin, wondering uh, what it was like in the 21st century and the question is, would this person have access to our email, our tweets, our blogs, our web pages, the URLs that we reference, and so on? And the answer is, doesn't sound like it, at least not if we don't do something about it. So I think that we are facing what I've been calling a kind of digital dark age, that our dependence uh, on digital content right now, just as ordinary people in our society, not, not as scientists, is actually risky if the software that we are relying on doesn't exist anymore, doesn't run on any of the new operating systems or hardware that show up in another 10, 20, 30 years, or even next year for that matter. So I think our 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodwin is going to have quite a challenge if we don't do something about it. And then it gets even worse. Instead of static content, what about executable stuff like games, for example? Uh, or uh, even something that's you know, as simple as WordPerfect or Microsoft Word or any of the other text editing uh, software that we have. When you look at a complex data object emerging from even those applications and you ask yourself, how will I be able to maintain correct renderability of that material? or manipulation in the case of a spreadsheet uh, over long periods of time. And it may turn out that the people who make this software uh, won't make it backward compatible to older formats. I think many of you will have already had the experience like I have. I have some 1997 PowerPoint slides and I pulled them up in the 2011 version of Microsoft PowerPoint and it basically said, what's that? And I said, it's a PowerPoint slide set, you blankety blank. And it didn't help. So, um, and I can't blame Microsoft. I don't, I don't think that it's reasonable to expect that a commercial product would necessarily always be made backward compatible to something that's 20 years old. So uh, we have a real challenge here trying to deal with content that was very much bound up to a particular application. You think about how much energy you would have put into making some of these things. I mean, some people will you know, write whole books uh, and you know all kinds of other artifacts using software which may not run anymore after a decade or two or even a few years. 
So these are just some of the challenges which should be absolutely obvious to everybody sitting in the room. Uh, so I don't po propose to go through here point by point. Um, but I, one thing, I mean, the first two are pretty obvious, but they're very important. Uh, but the thing in the upper right I also worry about, I mean, companies go bankrupt. And I don't know how much you know about bankruptcy law. Uh, I didn't used to know very much about it, except I worked for a company called MCI that was acquired by WorldCom that went bankrupt in 2002. So I learned about bankruptcy laws. I learned more than I wanted to know. Uh, and one of the things you learn is that the bankruptcy court thinks anything is an asset to be held onto and sold to somebody else. And so imagine that you're relying on software from some company that has gone bankrupt. And you say, uh, can I get a copy of the source code? The bankruptcy judge says, no, it's an asset that I plan to sell. Uh, well, can I get a copy of the object code? Well, no, you know, there are a whole series of things under bankruptcy law that might deny you and me access to the very thing we might need in order to keep using that software or running it in new environments. I've already mentioned the intellectual property rights and legal frameworks issues uh, that arise. So um, these are all, oh, you might wonder what's this digital x-ray about. Um, I'll come to that. Uh, it has to, it's a tactic, just a tactic for trying to capture uh, an operating system, a piece of application code, the hardware instruction set, and uh, the data files of a particular application in a kind of digital x-ray that you could use to slam down into a virtual machine and run the old code on top of this virtual environment. So uh, one of the projects that addresses this specific problem of executing old code is called Olive, like the thing you stick in your martini glass, developed at Carnegie Mellon. Mahadev Satya Narayanan, I really had to practice. We call him Satya for obvious reasons. Um, developed this technique. It was funded by NSF. And basically what he's trying to do is to run old software on top of virtual machines running on new hardware, which doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the hardware that originally ran the application. So there's a whole lot of moving parts in here to try to emulate precisely the hardware that ran an old operating system that runs the application that interprets the data correctly in this case, either renders the data correctly or maybe lets you manipulate it like a spreadsheet. Uh, and so the digital x-ray is a way of capturing all that information. Uh, it, unfortunately, there, you wouldn't do this, but there were some people in the reporter field who thought that I actually meant you take the laptop with the running application and stick it in an x-ray machine and you take a picture, and then that's all it was. Uh, so, so much for my ability to communicate. Um, <clears throat> he decided that you know these virtual machines with all of that data are really big, uh, you know, large pieces of code. And so he was trying to find a way to make it easier uh, to run. Instead of having everything all into your laptop, for example, he had the idea that if he could run this uh, kind of like the way we do Netflix. You know, Netflix doesn't necessarily download the entire video that you're watching. It just keeps feeding you pages and it tries to feed you pages ahead of time to keep you from getting that you know, delay signal. Uh, so that's pretty cool, except that uh, in the case of things like Netflix, it's a linear delivery, right? You know when the next page is due. On the other hand, if you're running a virtual machine and not all of the information that you need is in the virtual space, some of it's out here in the cloud, you have to be able to figure out what I should pull in next. So you have to kind of predict what pages are going to be needed. It's just sort of like typical virtual machine operations where you're trying to avoid page faults by preloading pages in that you think the operating system is going to need. This was uh, Peter Denning's uh, dissertation thesis around 1968, as I recall, the working set model. So he's tried to turn this, this problem into a kind of working set model, but uh, in a virtualized environment on the net. So streaming is not so easy, and I really alluded to most of the, uh, the hard part, in, including the prefetching and demand paging part, uh, which he's successfully implemented, which I find pretty amazing. So this is kind of what he does. Um, he's got whatever the hardware is at the bottom. So you imagine it's 100 years from now, and you've got whatever the new hardware is, some new operating system. And he's running a virtual machine on top of that operating system,
that has its own byte code. So it's not emulating the, the hardware of the machine it's running on. It's emulating a virtual machine code. And so that virtual machine code is emulating the hardware that the original system ran on. It turns out that's not as easy as it sounds. First of all, it may be hard to get details of how the hardware actually worked, what the instruction set looked like, how it executed, especially the ones that had bugs in them. Because sometimes the software only worked because of the bugs that were in the hardware. I mean, this is one of those, you know, my head is breaking. Um, but he discovered, and he's done this for, I don't know, a couple of dozen different operating systems and, uh, and machine platforms, and he's encountered these various gotchas. So the whole idea is that after you get this hardware emulator running on top of the virtual machine, then you load the operating system and the application and then process the data. And one interesting side effect of this uh, is that running old machines, uh, operating systems like DOS 3.1 or something with an application on it, in this new environment uh, had a timing problem because it ran faster in this emulated environment than it did on the original ancient machines. I'm sure it could also go the other way, uh, which is pointed out again in uh, David's book. Uh, but for the cases where it actually runs faster because the modern hardware is faster, uh, means that some of the games you might try to play, you can't win because the machine is running 100 times faster than it did before. <laughs> so, I mean, that's yet another little nuance in, in all of this. Uh, but this basic idea is a pretty powerful one, and he's been able to show that it can be made to work for quite a variety of real cases. Uh, so you can sort of imagine, you know, he's got this linear, linearized thing with the description of the, of the hardware written in XML, which is interesting, and then the disk image of uh, the uh, operating system and the application and the actual data. So that gets all downloaded either all at once in some big local machine or paged in through, uh, through the net. So this is one way to do it where everything including the virtual machine is running local to the user and we're just pulling pieces of the virtual machine uh, or the, uh, the executable. Uh, in from the from the net, what he did in this case was make sure that all of the fetches are done using standard uh, World Wide Web HTML uh, HTTP uh, fetches, so that for all practical purposes the internet sees this as just another uh, web-based uh, application. Even though, of course, it's doing something pretty unusual in the uh, machine that's receiving all this, and he also. Uh, did the same thing by exporting the whole virtual machine into the cloud somewhere and then just pulling images in, sort of like X Windows, for some of you might remember that from MIT years ago. This has a very interesting property that uh, you can imagine using the cloud as the mechanism for running old hardware, running old software on old emulated hardware in a cloud which has the ability to expand capacity. Uh, in order to run many of them or to run one uh, at adequate speed. So this is where uh, the, the program ended up uh, at Carnegie Mellon. It's sort of in uh, uh, maintenance mode at this point because uh, the NSF funding has run out. Personally, I think this is an important uh, element of preservation in the long term and that somehow it should be revived, but now we're back to questions of business model and how to achieve that objective. So there are a lot of technical challenges here. Um, and I, I, again, I don't want to take up too much time with the details as much as to get to some of your uh, questions and comments. But uh, Sacha is very quick to say that there's nothing simple about doing these uh, emulations. And it can be hard to get them exactly right, especially if the hardware maker is not interested in giving you all the details of exactly how the hardware worked uh, and what its uh, proclivities are. So there are other projects that uh, come to mind. I've already mentioned the uh, archive, uh, Internet Archive that Brewster is running. And the Computer History Museum out on the West Coast is also accumulating software as well as artifacts, machines, some of which still run, uh, and other computing things. And of course, at Google, we've been doing book scans. And we also have this thing called the Cultural Institute that we set up in Paris in the building that used to belong to the French National Railroad. Uh, so I don't know how we acquired that. I, maybe I don't even want to know. But uh, we ended up with this lovely old building with all these beautiful ceilings. 
But in that building is a, a wall the size of this screen covered with high resolution displays. We are accumulating literally bazillions of, um, of uh, images coming from museums all over the world that they, they have either sent to us or used our platform to instantiate all this so that people can visit museums anywhere through the net or they can assemble virtual um, uh, art exhibits. Like if you want to see a major exhibit uh, of Van Gogh, you can't, I mean, most, a lot of it's in the Netherlands, but a lot of it's elsewhere. And so you can literally assemble a museum that doesn't exist uh, with these uh, virtual uh, images available. Uh, or they're real images, but it's a virtual museum that you assemble using, <coughs> using the Culture Institute. So I'm going to stop there, I think, because that is the last slide, and uh, ask if you have any questions or issues you'd like to raise. Uh, and you know, of course, if not, you all get to go home early or something. But uh, I would be happy to, uh, to try to respond to questions or comments that you might have. And in any case, I appreciate very much the time to join you this afternoon. Thank you. So we have microphones, and there we already have a question. So. Now I'm just reminding people that if you have questions, please come to the microphones. And if you are too far in and can't get out, just signal to us, and we'll pass a microphone in for you. So we're going to, before you ask, let me just warn you. I'm hearing impaired, and I'm not the guy that came to speak and didn't want to listen. But we're going to, we've got this repeater here, which may work. If it doesn't, I'm going to run down the stage in case I have to lip read, which will cause the guy who's videotaping to go slightly crazy. Uh, but I promise I won't bite and I don't spit. So, okay, ask away and let's see where we go. You've mentioned particularly, for instance, reading WordPerfect 1.0 documents. One of the problems there is that there is no standard, say, word processing format. I know that there's OpenDoc as an effort. My understanding is OpenDoc is, shall we say, not trivial to implement. It would seem as though between NIST and the federal government that NIST might be a useful tool with your influence with them to declare some standard document formats that then the federal government would only buy Wow. programs that were able to read and write those formats? And so I, I can imagine some companies wanting to have that happen. Um, the trouble is the government doesn't always come up with the right answer for stuff like this. Uh, and besides, that may only work for a finite period of time. Uh, imagine you're the National Archives. I know those guys. And what happens every four or eight years is that people show up with disk drives. Disk drives! They just hand them these things. These are the records of the US government. And these guys have to index the disk drives, figure out what's on there and everything else. There are formats that have been uh, adopted by many, like PDFA, which is the archival PDF format. But I will guarantee you that over time, the complex digital objects that we have are not just simply renderable. They are, you know, you have to interact with the software in order to make use of the object that's been created. And so we should be really careful not to fall into the, it's just a document trap. And I'm certainly not accusing you of that. But I worry about trying to pick a format only later to discover that there are things I want to express that I can't with whatever that chosen uh, object is. I'll give you a concrete example of this. The requests for comments that are used to document the internet standards were created in 1969. The format was ASCII text only. So all the figures and everything else had to be made with little X's and zeros and dashes and everything else. And John Postel, the editor, absolutely insisted that we stick with that because it was, had the high probability of being renderable over really long periods of time. And he was right, because those documents have been available for quite a long time. But now the community is saying, I need to show things that are a lot more complicated than that, and I don't have time to try to draw them using ASCII text. And so they're shifting to PDF uh, types of structures. So no matter what we do, uh, we're going to end up with some variation uh, in document formats. What I think would be, while I think that might help some, what would be even better would be to figure out how we describe those things uh, 
so that you could take a piece of software using the description and automatically generate something that correctly interprets the, the object. That would be the ideal outcome from my point of view. Figuring out whether we can do that is an interesting challenge. Some of you will have heard the term compiler compiler. Some of us used to write programming languages using compiler compilers that would create a compiler for the language that you were designing, which then would compile a program and then execute. I can remember having trouble remembering whether it, is this going to happen at compiler compiler time or compiler time or at execution time, and that was not always so easy. But we, I think our aspirations should be in the direction of being able to ingest an object if we know what it is, if we know what, it, what its structure is, and be able to generate uh, programs that know what to do with it. So there. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, during your talk, you mentioned repeatedly the importance of business models and yes. of economic incentives. Uh, but I didn't hear or at least catch any examples of, uh, of working or even workable uh, options. So uh, let me give you one. Uh, well, there, there are a bunch. Uh, let me start with an analog. When uh, Internet was built, uh, we had no clue uh, how it was going to be uh, supported. Uh, we, we knew that the government was paying for it initially. That was, made it, that was the easy case. Uh, but we wanted to become commercialized and self-supporting. And so in the end, the architecture said, we don't care what your business model is. So some people run not-for-profit pieces of it. Some people run for-profit pieces. Some people run personal machines like we do at home. And some people are uh, running uh, government-sponsored components. But it all works together because no one is forced to use someone else's business model. So the first observation I would make is that we should think in terms of multiple possible business models for uh, systems like this, some of which might be very commercial and some of which are not. But I will give you one very interesting example. Uh, there's a guy in Ireland who has started a company called eMortal, and, uh, and basically it is aimed at helping people save all their family stories and photographs and videos and all these other things for you know, the next generations. And the question is, what's the business model? It's actually an interesting experiment. Uh, he's gone to the life insurance companies and said, you know, you've insured your life and the legacy is money going to your heirs. Why don't you insure your digital legacy as well? Why don't we make that part of the service that the life insurance, now it's digital life insurance uh, product. And I want you to think for a minute about what you know about life insurance. Think about this business model. Here's the deal. I'm going to come to you, I'm the life insurance salesman, I'm coming to you and I'm selling you this thing which you're going to have to pay me for until you die. Okay, first of all, that's a great business model, right? You know, they just keep <laughs> paying until you're dead. It's really death insurance, but you wouldn't buy that. So life insurance is you know, a clever naming tactic. So, so the deal is you come to me, I come to you and I say, I will not only insure your life so that when you're gone, your heirs will get some money, but I will also ensure the preservation of your digital story. And you know, I don't know if this guy is gonna succeed or not, but of all the business models I can think of, that's the only one I know of where you ask people to keep paying you until they die, <laughs> as opposed to keep paying until the mortgage is paid off, whichever comes first. So, um, <laughs> so those are, are I mean, that's not a wonderful broad set of uh, possible um, answers. It's sort of like the domain name world, which found various and sundry ways of, uh, of uh, supporting itself. So the answer is somebody out there is probably going to invent some interesting business models. Maybe it will be you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, in H.G. Wells' machine, the, uh, a book, The Time Machine, uh, the traveler goes way, way back, way, way forward in time. And he encounters uh, uh, our descendants uh, who have a meager library, which basically crumbles in his hands. How would you envision that? It crumbles in his hands. I mean, maybe the books are so old. That oh, uh, oh, oh, okay. Well, you know, some of you might track this uh, physical media. Uh, 
There's at least a, a report that comes out every, every, every once in a while where somebody has found a medium that really lasts a long time. There's at least one example. The claim is that it will last 10 to the 20th years. Of course, they haven't had 10 to the 20th years to test that, but, but the assertion is it's, it's a, you know, a photonic uh, recording system. I did see one other example which I was fascinated by. Some people have now figured out how to use DNA just the, literally the deoxyribonucleic chain for uh, encoding of digital information. So they generate the chain, and it's, it's a specific sequence that is interpreted as binary code. Uh, it, the reason I bring this up is that I learned from them, they're in the UK, that if you remove water from DNA, it's remarkably resilient. The stuff is really stable, and as long as it's not wet. Once it's wet, it's a different story. So you can kind of imagine somebody going to the trouble of encoding quite a bit of information in a tiny amount of space, and you might also imagine that the ability to uh, get a sequence of DNA, now that we know how to do this, will probably not be lost. And if it is lost, maybe it's not worth remembering anything anyway. But, but that, those two things uh, struck me as very interesting, but they are all about the preservation medium and the ability to read it. But that's only getting bits back. It still doesn't address all the other part that has to be in place in order to make sense of what the bits are. But in terms of long-term long media, I'm beginning to see potential for things that could last a very, very long period of time and not crumble. First, just an observation or a piece of information. I don't know if you're aware that the DC Public Library has just opened in its main library something called, they're calling, I think it's a memory lab. No, that's Which is an open lab with a whole lot of equipment for you to transfer information from one medium uh. to another. And you can reserve it in three hour blocks, which, you know, most of this stuff takes forever to do. But um, I just, it's a public resource and anybody can get a library card even if you don't live in DC. That's actually a really interesting observation about libraries and their function in our society. They keep finding new ways to be useful as opposed to a place where you stick a bunch of books. So I didn't know that. That's actually very interesting and yeah. it's encouraging. Of course, if everybody decided they wanted to do that, uh, we'd probably overwhelm the facilities at the library. So that leaves us the open question, how do we scale this up? Uh, for people that care about their their information, but thank you, that's good to know. Yeah, they have they have a um, a big initiative on documenting on um, maintaining your own personal archives. Uh, I so. always the problem with maintaining your own personal archives, of course, is that you have to keep rewriting stuff. And I don't know about you, but I have boxes full of VHS tapes, which I someday plan to migrate to <laughs> something else. Uh, and I have not done well uh, at that. I did manage to get all the eight millimeter videos transferred over into DVDs. I was very proud of myself for having done that. Of course, now I can't play them on my Mac, you know, so now I'm all angry again. Well, this brings me to my more important comment. Um, I'm involved in records management here at Goddard, and uh, in 2012, there was an executive order um, that was issued by the government that to um, that government records would be an elect mostly electronic form by 2019. We have a lot of, we generate a tremendous amount of records here yeah. that we ha have to submit for archive at NARA. Many of those records are in databases. And exactly. Uh, NARA has not really provided, they say, well, we can ingest it, you know, if it's SQL or Oracle or whatever, we can ingest it, but it's, they're in proprietary databases. Yep. They have relationships. Yep. They have structures. Um, and um, it's not really clear how that's supposed to happen. That, well, that your, your OAIS team has the, the right idea for dealing with this, but we don't have a set of specific implementations that you could just turn to in order to turn the crank. I always get worried about these unfunded mandates People come to me and say, what should I do with my photograph, my digital photographs? My honest answer is, the ones you really care about, print them, because we know that prints last at least 150 years. We don't know anything about how long any digital format is likely to survive. Now, I don't know about you, but I have examples of pictures that I ingested into a photograph management system, 
which suddenly in its latest version doesn't know what, what a TIFF format is or doesn't know what GIF format is or GIF or however. And so I'm, I am now persuaded that printing stuff out may turn out to be the most reliable medium for that which could be printed. But as you point out, databases, I mean, how do you print a database? How do you print a spreadsheet? I mean, you, sure, you can print an instance of the spreadsheet, but printing all of the formulas and everything else, what would, now would that look like? Ugh. Yes, okay, thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, my question will be about textbooks. Okay. Uh, I'm asking if you are aware of any projects to select, uh, translate from different languages if needed, collection of the best textbooks for all countries, for all times, and preserve them. Uh, instead, uh, archiving tweets or video games. I think in the case if something will happen, collection of good textbooks will be the replica, the footprint of our civilization. Is it true? So, so uh, let me make sure I've understood. You're asking about the ability to translate the textbooks. In yes, because we have a lot of uh, um, printed textbooks in different languages. Yes. And, uh, for example, we have a lot of uh, German books and Russian yes. books, uh, beautiful textbooks. They are not available for, for people in with it's true. different li languages. So, so um, um, I, let me say with my Google hat on for a moment that we work really, really hard to try to build translators from one language to another. Some of you will have used our Google Translate and you, uh, you see what we're able to do and what doesn't necessarily work very well. For technical textbooks, it's a challenge to get the translation to work right. On the other hand, for mathematics books, the language is so stilted and so regular that that turns out to have been easier to do than some of the you know, more um, diverse kinds of text. Uh, we've, we've gotten past the point where I remember being in 1960 when we thought translation would be a matter of, of putting in, an, uh, for example, an English-Russian dictionary into the computer and just running the words and translating them. We tried this at Stanford, and we thought we would challenge the system by putting in a, an expression, out of sight, out of mind. And what we got back was something in Russian, then we translated that back into English, and it said, invisible idiot <laughs> and okay I think we have a problem so so the answer is I don't know of a systematic translation program but I will say that for confined uh, languages like mathematics uh, the translation automatic translation may actually have some potential but for the richer stuff, I'm not so sure. The semantics are so critical in the technical uh, work. So that's a big challenge. Oh, thank you. But, but uh, are you saying that in English, at least there's, there's some database of textbooks available for everyone for free? Uh, well, um, this raises another interesting issue about copyright and who owns the texts. This, the solution to this, by the way, in the case of software, has been open source software which often is just given away, like we do with Android and some of our other uh, uh, applications. Um, I don't know whether there is a strong effort right now to generate uh, free textbooks. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you are aware of this, but I don't know of any, the closest I've seen anybody come to that is not a textbook. Uh, it's the uh, Khan Academy where those short videos of teaching people how to do mathematics have been successful for a large number of people. For, th for those of you who haven't noticed this, um, young people these days, millennials for example, when they go looking for information, don't actually go to the Google web search. They go to YouTube because there's bound to be somebody who actually did a video showing you how to do X for some value of X. Now, I mean, it's quite surprised to learn that. Um, so we should be thoughtful about whether the, the medium of transferring knowledge is going to continue to be textbook or whether it's going to be something else. But in either case, if language is an issue, it's a challenge exactly as you point out. Thank you. Uh, let me get the one from, oh, he's jumping the queue. Talk about a hack. <laughs>
Right, how about that? Okay. No, it's all right. Go ahead. That's why we have two microphones, but that may cause half the people over here to run over there. Okay. Um, yes. I feel uh, compelled to fund my uh, to defend my mother agency, Nara. Uh, Yay! <laughs> Uh, I'm, no. I'm sorry, I didn't in any way mean to suggest anything negative. I think NARA has a huge challenge, and they've been whacking away at this for a long time. Yeah, um, and the, the two comments. The first one is NARA has been accessioning databases for 45 years. We have a tremendous amount of experience, and in fact, databases are one of the easiest things that we ingest. Um, the second one is I think you'll be pleasantly surprised for the... 22nd century Doris Kearns. Ah, yes, tell me. Um, because as you pointed out, every 48 years we get the president's records, not the entire federal government's records. And we have all the email for every president who's ever used email going back to Reagan. Official. Wow. <laughs> official. <laughs> yes. Right. There They're we go. official email. Right. Uh, yes, I this stand corrected. Zero, right. Yes, yeah. right. Yes, very clever. So did, you get, had, did you get Hillary Clinton? Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Official, yes. yes. <laughs> Sir. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad you brought up the uh, business model. Uh, in fact, I've uh, experienced that the uh, business model actually has been a problem rather than a solution mm. in that many times uh, a modern business model is to change the format very frequently and then oh. hold your data hostage Yes. Um, so that, in fact, I have lots of data that is not uh, a thousand years old, but, yeah. in fact, nine it's, months old yes. that I cannot uh, access. And, in fact, uh, not being uh, a computer expert, often I'm unaware of which program I'm missing or which version of which program that I'm missing. Yeah. So even if I gave, uh, even with the data, uh, I'm often left uh, trying to read the bits and uh, make up what the meaning might have been. Oh. And I'm wondering if you have any comment or a solution to this uh, problem. Well, you know, this actually gets to uh, something I only lightly uh, discussed, and that's this question of preservation rights and the notion that for purposes of preservation, that is to say preservation of meaning, that there should be you as the user of that software should have the right to get access to older versions of the software and that it needs to be made available by in some way that's useful to you by the people who created that software. We don't have any rules like that right now. And with the uh, advent of cloud computing, uh, in, it's theoretically possible to make the older software available and to run it against the data that you have. And so the technical means to do some of these things may actually be within our grasp, but the rules to force companies to cooperate uh, isn't there. And I, I think that your examples and the examples that others might offer uh, make, in my view, a very compelling case for changing rules to allow preservation to be part of the equation. It's sort of like the rules that said you could copy your, a private copy of a movie maybe that you bought on a DVD, that you were allowed to make a copy of that for backup purposes. And eventually, in order to avoid having you freely make copies of everything, the companies that were selling uh, the DVDs, for example, also made a CD-ROM copy for you, and you often end up with you know, two things. So uh, this, uh, this argument that you owe it to the people that are relying on your software to help them preserve the utility of what you created with it uh, goes a long way with me. Now, whether it goes a long way with the copyright councils of the, you know, the world, it remains to be seen. But I think we should make a really loud noise exactly along those lines for the reasons that you imply.
Okay, we have, are we uh, running over time here? I'm going to cut it off after this next question, which oh, raises you an interesting only, point that I hadn't thought of. So ask your question, oh, okay. and you can either answer this fully or leave it hanging in the air as, oh. as you wish. Oh, and our speaker right. might have time afterwards to answer individual questions. Yeah, I'm happy to up. chat for a little while after okay. we're officially done. Yeah. Last question. Uh, well, then I shall be quick. Uh, let's assume that I'm a techno-optimist and I believe that technology will continue to progress. Why shouldn't I assume that this problem will solve itself? Okay. Uh, yeah. let, me, let, me give you, let me give you the... Uh, you're like that young twit that was uh, sitting, uh, sitting in... Uh, my definition of young keeps changing. But uh, I, was, I had a collection of librarians and we were discussing this very thing. And um, this young fellow got up and he said, oh, look, this isn't a problem. Uh, the stuff that's important will get copied into you know, new formats, and the stuff that isn't important won't, and nobody will notice, you know, so what's the big deal? It took me half an hour to get the librarians off the ceiling, <laughs> and the, the reason is that they pointed out that you don't know what's important, sometimes for 100 years or hundreds of years, and then you realize that this particular thing, if you only had it, would explain something important to you, in, you know, historically speaking, or in the case of our scientific community, if I only had the data from that date and event, I could compare it with what I have now. So the answer is, it won't solve itself because it hasn't solved itself. And if we don't do something, if we don't take action, it will not solve itself. So you may choose not to believe that, but I will argue that the people who work in this space in my own experience over the last 40 years, 45 years, uh, is that the problem has not been solved by itself over that period of time, and I do not see any natural solution unless we really focus on what's getting in the way of getting something to work. So there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you.